morning, Word Fellowship Reformed Baptist Church. Praise the Lord. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 21. Please listen to the word of our God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them in prophecy in proportion to your faith, to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does act of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, 
be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. today. Please give boldness and give confidence to your vessel, our pastor, as he proclaims your word. Please, God, open our ears to hear. Lord, please help us to act upon your word today. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Eternal God, most gracious Heavenly Father, we come this morning making the declaration that you reign. You reign above everything that exists. You are our master and you are our Lord. And we yield to you as the all authoritative one of the universe. And now, Father, as we come down to this hour of preaching, we pray that you give us a fixation on you. Lord, with our every fiber of our being, Lord, let us sit attentively and hear and understand your voice this morning. That the words that are proclaimed today be that which calls us to have a renewed desire to obey you in all things. Lord, we lift you up. We magnify you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. God, our Father, we come before your amazing presence. We come in amazement and awe. Oh, God, you are truly amazing. And because we recognize your presence, your power, we come now humbly with our petition, asking God that you would help us. For we realize and recognize we are incapable of doing anything in our own strength and power. So we ask you, our amazing God and Father, to speak with my mouth, think with my mind, help me to say those things that are consistent with sound Bible doctrine. Glorify yourself. Send your Holy Spirit he may lead, guide, and teach us that we might hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Help me, God, I come in weakness, fear, and trembling. I need you for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Romans chapter 12 is where our text is found. The scripture has already been read. I will read verse 1 and 2 in your hearing. And then we will seek to hear what the Spirit of God has to say to us from that which he has already said. Starting at verse 1, please listen to the word of our God. Good morning, Word Fellowship. Love you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God, what is good, acceptable and perfect. So reads the word of our God. Saints, we are continuing on this subject matter of the unique greatness of Jesus Christ. As I have stated in the weeks past that my aim in preaching on the unique greatness of Jesus Christ that you would be amazed at the person of Jesus Christ, that you would be in awe of the power of Jesus Christ, and that you would be attached to the person, power, and purpose of Jesus Christ. To what end? That we might be strengthened to live fruitful, and productive lives for the glory of God in the midst of an evil and crooked world. It is my sincere prayer that by seeing the unique greatness of Jesus Christ that we would trust him regardless of life 
circumstances or situations that we may find ourselves in. Again, I stated that I want you to see him more clearly, to follow him more nearly, to love him more dearly, and to trust and obey him more sincerely. I am attempting in all of my weakness to declare to you the unique greatness of Jesus Christ. Now, if you would just think back for a moment and reflect, we have seen the greatness and uh, the unique greatness of Jesus Christ uh, declared to us in the words that he declared about himself in John 14. Those exclusive claims that he made about uh, him being uh, the way, the truth, and the life, that he was all of those things in and of himself. And those with troubled hearts can look to him and to him alone to find comfort for your troubled and heavy hearts. Not only did we see it, the unique greatness of Jesus Christ in the words he declared, but we saw the unique greatness of Jesus Christ in the witness that he demonstrated. Being tempted there in that lonely and dark wilderness, he displayed the ability to resist the temptations of the devil and, and thus demonstrating and proving that he is the sovereign king that Matthew proclaims, that he is the suffering servant uh, that Mark proclaims, that he is uh, the God-man who Luke proclaims, and he is the son of God who John proclaims. So we see his unique greatness in what he declares about himself and what he uh, demonstrated by himself. But we will today see his unique greatness in the work that he developed by himself and the work he is developing by himself. The building of the body of Christ, which is the church. Now, if I could just give you this sermon uh, in a sentence, uh, I, would, I would simply put it like this, that the unique greatness of Jesus Christ is seen in the extended mercies to hell-deserving sinners. Let me play that back for you. Uh, the unique greatness of Jesus Christ is seen in his extended mercies to hell deserving sinners. Romans 12 gives to us the appropriate responses to the mercies of God. How, how should one live in light of the mercies of Almighty God? How should we function? How should we, how should we act in, 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 in response to these extended mercies? And here in Romans, uh, we are talking about redemptive mercies. We don't want to confuse because uh, 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 the mercies of God uh, falls upon everybody for uh, God uh, extends his grace to uh, to the just and the unjust. But here I'm talking specifically uh, to the church, those who have been bought with a price, those who have been redeemed, those who have been regenerated, those who have been justified, sanctified, and will be glorified. What is your appropriate response in living to the mercies of God. See, it is his mercies that actually produces the appropriate responses. 
And in this chapter, what we see, we see three appropriate responses that were produced by the mercies of God. Well, what are they? I'm glad you asked. In verses 1 and 2, uh, we see uh, the appropriate response to our relationship with God. Secondly, in verses 3 through 16, there is uh, our relationship to other believers. And lastly, in verses 17 through 21, uh, we see the relationship to our enemies. And so what the passage is showing us uh, it is the, the responses that is expected and commanded by God because we are the recipient of his redemptive mercy. You know, in the Bible, there are many uh, metaphors that are used in uh, graphic illustrations of the church. Uh, the church is the vine, the, the vine that is connected to uh, the true vine. The church is mentioned as the flock of God. We are uh, given that imagery of sheep and God being our shepherd. The church is depicted as the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ and Christ uh, being, uh, being the groom. church is pictured as a field, a field where God does his planting, where he does his cultivating, where he produces his fruit. The church is the, the, the temple of God. It is the, 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 the place where uh, Christ uh, dwells and indwells in person of Holy Spirit where uh, real worship takes place. The church is the, the family of God. The family of God. Uh, God's own people, his children, his sons, his, his daughters. And the good news is God has no stepchildren. The church is the household of God. But here in our passage, Paul is speaking of the church as the body of Christ. As the body of Christ. And I believe this is significant in all of the imageries that is used of the church. Uh, Apostle Paul, and you can, you can fact check me, uh, but I believe he is the only one throughout all of Scripture that uses this imagery of the body of Christ. And I believe this is something that took place on uh, the God stamped on the screens of his soul on that Damascus road when Christ uh, saved him and asked him the question, uh, 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 Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? Yeah. And he's saying, who are you, Lord? And literally, he was persecuting the church. He was persecuting the body of Christ. And therefore, he was persecuting the head of the body. And so Paul uses this type of language in talking about uh, the church. Now again, this, this imagery of the church is God's unique way of showing the various relational dimensions of our relationship to him and the intimate identity that we have with him and one another. So it is the unique greatness of Jesus Christ that we see and understand the importance and uh, the essentialness 
of the church. The, the, the church is very essential, not only to society, but to the world. And those of us who ever built anything or have been involved in some uh, type of building, we all know that building starts with a purpose and it starts with a plan. The purpose is the original intent. It is the why. The plan is the, the how. Uh, so we have the why something is built and then we have the how it is to be built. And in construction, uh, you often have a, a owner who has a, a desire for a particular thing and then he wants to build it so he finds a designer. And then the designer, he needs architect. And the architect needs uh, contractors and the, uh, the contractor needs those who know how to do uh, structural work and then you need uh, the mechanical side of it and then there are electricians, there are plumbers, there is the material that will be needed and then there's the tools and, and etc. You, you get what I'm trying to say. But notice, it takes all of this, it takes all of these various people with various skills in order to construct a building or a house. Oh, but I rejoice today because the unique greatness of Jesus Christ is seen in his uh, building of the church uh, with, uh, he does it all with three people. He only uses three people who are actually one. Uh, it is uh, the Father, it is the Son, it is the Holy Spirit. So, so in a sense, Jesus, in his unique greatness, he builds the church all by himself. That's why he can uh, declare in Matthew chapter 16, uh, upon this rock, upon the clear understanding of who I am, I will be building... Notice, I will be building my church. And the very gates of hell, the devil and all of his forces cannot stop, cannot hinder the building of my church. This is a declaration of a sovereign builder. Now, can I ask you a question? Sure, sure, go ahead, go right ahead. Uh, what kind of material does this unique great one use in building his church? Well, uh, most contractors and builders, they, they always want to uh, use uh, the best, the most sturdy of material in the building process. But Jesus' unique greatness is seen in the fact that he takes defective material. He takes marred people. He takes stained and, and corrupted people and use them in the material process of building his church. Because the stability of the church uh, it's not really based on the material, it's based on the builder. And he builds, watch this, well, I mean, don't he have to have some tools? Uh, I know, you know, they, build, they have the, uh, the bulldozers and all of the different machinery, hammers and nails and uh, uh, what? What, what, what are the primary tools that he used? Well, well, the primary tools that Jesus uses in building the church are called mercies. 
Oh, you didn't get that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, 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 it's mercies. That, that, that's plural. He, he's got a whole bunch of mercies that he uses in the constructive process in using defective material. <laughs> I'm telling you, he is uniquely great. And so Paul uses 11 chapters to explain to us what are the tools, what are the mercies that God has used and is using in the construction of his church? Are you interested? See, the whole point of this letter in Romans, uh, when the mercies are genuinely applied to the defective material, its result uh, it, it turns into a beautiful construction in the lives of the defective people. So all of their maredness and corruption, all of that is, is fading away in the constructing process of this great builder. And their responses to the mercies of God cause them to respond in an appropriate relationship in three areas. It is the mercies of God that cause them to respond uh, in a proper relationship with God, with believers, and even their enemies. Our text here said, I appeal to you, and look at that word, therefore, Therefore, again, it's telling us to, to read back and to uh, uh, view the mercies of God. But notice something. Uh, I think this is inter interesting, and I think it's a great point to share with you. There are four therefores in this book of uh, uh, Romans. Uh, four therefores, I find. There is the therefore of condemnation. In chapter 3 and verse 20, because of our uh, depravity, because of our sin, because of our being separated uh, from God, because the whole world had been uh, uh, declared guilty, there's a therefore. Therefore, because of sin, because of yourself, therefore you're guilty. But then in chapter 5, verse 1, there is the therefore of justification. Therefore, now you have been justified, and now, therefore, you have peace with God. Then in chapter 8, there's the therefore of assurance. Therefore, now, if any man be in Christ, uh, 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 I mean, no, therefore, uh, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? But here in chapter 12, verse 1, and I'm trying to get there, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, there is the therefore of dedication and commitment. And the therefore of dedication and commitment is the response that is appropriate based on the mercies of chapter 1 all the way through chapter 11. And so this dedication is the appropriate response to the mercies of God, and it involves three simple movements. I want to share them with you, and then I'm going to go to my seat. This dedication is an appropriate response, and first it's seen in relationship to God. Look at the text. I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be uh, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what uh, is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. 
Uh, notice I see three things that this relationship uh, to God uh, requires of us because of his mercies. And notice, before he talks about any other relationships to anybody, he first talks about the relationship to God. If you are a recipient of God's redemptive mercy, your first and foremost importance has to be your relationship to him. And so Paul says three things about this relationship to God. The first, uh, well, three things, I'll give them to you uh, right out front. He says, uh, give your body to God. Give your mind to God and give your will to God. That's what a healthy relationship with God looks like when you are the recipient of his redemptive mercies. Notice he said, give him your body. Give, give, uh, I, I appeal to you that you uh, uh, present your bodies, your, 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 your physical body. Give, give all of yourself Notice, as a living sacrifice. Now, you know, sacrifices, Old Testament, were always dead. But literally what he's saying, when he say a living sacrifice, he says, present your life to God as if you are dead. Come to the conclusion that the mercies of God has brought you to the end of yourself. Give God your body. Well, 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 why? Well, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 said, don't you know that, you are the that, that you've you been bought with a price? He, he, he has purchased you by his own blood. But not only give him your body, give him your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you are a true recipient of uh, the redemptive mercies of God, then your mind must be controlled by him or you're going to be out of order. Yeah. Notice the verse, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of you. The world wants to control your mind. And God wants to transform. That word transform is where we get our word metamorphosis. All your life you have lived with this uh, caterpillar type of thinking. And now God wants uh, a butterfly type of thinking to come out of you that you can quit crawling and start flying. then God wants your will. Now watch this. The mind is controlled by the body. And uh, the will controls the mind. Therefore, I must surrender uh, my will to his will. Because even though uh, uh, sin no longer reigns still, sin still remains. I mean, still uh, 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 remains. And so therefore, sin uh, desires to still rule me. And so therefore, I must bring my will in subjection to God's will. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, uh, pray, thy will be done. Thy, how, thy will be done how? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And how is it done in heaven? It's done perfectly, instantly, and completely. And so really, the relationship to God, becoming a Christian by the redemptive mercies of God, is really coming to the end of you. Real, this is real dedication. This is real commitment in relationship to God as a result of his mercies. But lest I keep you too long, I see something else. Notice, it moves from 
the vertical relationship to God to the horizontal relationship to people. Yeah. And so in verses uh, 3 through uh, 16, he talks about our relationship to other believers. Yeah. Now, it divides up beautifully because in verses 4 through 8, he's talking about our gifts and abilities. And therefore, with gifts and abilities, guess what you got to do? You've got to evaluate. You've got to find yours. Because if you are not operating in your gift, then you will start to uh, envy others or try to do something that God has not gifted you for. So first of all, you've got to evaluate. So in verses 4 through 8, there are the gifts and abilities. But in verses 9 through 16, uh, it's about the attitude of the gifts. Because it's possible to have the right gifts and the wrong attitude. And so often we see people who are extremely gifted, but they have bad attitudes. And this stuff starts internal before it can have any meaningful help externally. I'm in the Bible. I'm in the Bible. Because in verse 3 it says, For the grace uh, given uh, to me, I say uh, to everyone among you, notice where he starts, not to what? Think of himself more highly than he ought to. So the first thing that we got to have in place in relationship to other believers is humility. And what it is that cultivates my humility in relationship to my brother and sister is the redemptive mercies that I received in chapter 1 through 11. Everything goes back to the mercies of God because if it wasn't for the mercies of chapter 1 through 11, guess what? I wouldn't have no brothers and sisters. I wouldn't even be a part of the body. You're not a part of the body because of what you did. Chapter 1 through 11 is all about what he did. But not only the relationship to other believers has to be seen in humility, but it also has to be seen in unity. There, there, there is uh, unity for in verse 4, he clearly says, for as in one body, notice, we are unified in one body even though we have uh, distinctions in our function. We're all equal in dignity, but there is distinctions in our function. So there has to be humility, there has to be uh, unity, but then you push on down and you get to verse 9, then he brings it, and it's got to be love. If you are the recipient of redemptive mercy, notice what he said. Let love be genuine. We don't care how Gifted, nobody is. We don't care how well you expound upon the scripture, Atkinson. We, we want to know, is your love genuine? Do you abhor what is evil and not what's evil about other people? It's so easy, saints, to get upset about the flaws, the sins, and the errors of other people. When's the last time you cried over your sin? David said, I hate every evil way. When David says he hates every evil way, he's not talking about he hates everybody else's sin. He is including his own. Anything that opposes the will, the purpose, and the plan of God, I hate. And some of that sometimes come out of me. Abhor what is evil. Notice, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with, with brotherly affection. 
And if you want to get into a competition in the church, he say, that's all right. Ain't nothing wrong with you competing, but here's what you need to compete on. Compete on outdoing one another in showing honor. Be, be the one in the body that shows more honor to us. Don't let them outshow you. Uh, 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 they, you, you know, they try to honor you, you honor them. They honor you and want, hey, you find a better way to honor them. Now, so if you want to compete, that's the only place we permitted to compete. Don't be slowful, lazy. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. What do you mean be patient in, in tribulation? When, when stuff coming up against you, when all the stuff around you is falling apart, be patient. God got it. He, he, he not just doing something around you. He's trying to do something to you. Well, what he trying to do? Uh, next piece say, be constant in prayer. He trying to get you to pray more. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, you, you know, maybe you have a little bit too much confidence in yourself. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Show hospitality. Oh, Lord. So show hospitality. Know how to be kind and respectful and welcoming to people into your presence. It's a dangerous and, and, and demonic thing not to know how uh, to be uh, hospitable. And I'm telling you, sometimes in life, the very thing that can hinder you from being hospitable is because of two things. Sometimes what you see and sometimes what you feel. You've got other stuff going on and the other stuff that's going on makes you neglect the responsibility that God has said to be hospitable. I'm not making it up. It's in your Bible in Hebrews 13 and uh, uh, 13 2 says, uh, be careful how you entertain and show hospitality to strangers because you might be entertaining an angel. You don't know who it is and why it is God has brought people into your presence. He goes on in there to say, bless those who persecute you. Notice, just, and, and again, these are instructions to how we relate to other believers. Sometimes, guess what? Some of the persecution can even come from another believer. So there's the relationship to other believers, there's the relationship with God, but lest I hold you too long, uh, there is the relationship to our enemies. The redemptive mercies of God prescribes and commands how we're supposed to interact with our enemies. Look at verse 17, I'm not making it up, there it is. Pay no one evil for evil. Uh, don't be trying to get people back. But notice, but give thought, notice, notice it. Give thought. See, it, it, it's telling you where the repaying of evil will come from. It'll come when you don't have the proper thought process in relationship to the mercies of God. And so give, but, 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 but notice, but give thought to what is honorable. So, so much of what we do in action really comes from what we are in entertaining in thought. Give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. 
Notice, in the sight of all, you've got to consider that there are onlookers. And they've heard you say that you are a recipient of the mercies of God. And so how you respond to the evil that comes against you is going to determine uh, uh, how somebody else will see Christ in and through your life. Notice what it says, if possible, I'm almost through. If possible, so far as it depends on others. No, I think I misread that. If possible, so far as it depends on you in interaction with your enemy. Quit expecting your enemy to change. Your enemy is not a recipient of uh, the redemptive mercies of God, even though they have received mercy. Everybody alive is a product of mercy. But my point is they don't have the redemptive mercy. Therefore, they are a natural man, and therefore they cannot see. The natural man receives not the things of God, neither can he know them. They must be spiritually discerned. But as much as it depends on you, child of God, live peaceably. Don't go around offending people. Now we know that the gospel can be offensive, and it is offensive. But the Christian should not be offensive. Let the word offend, not your witness. I know it's getting a little hot. I know it's getting a little heavy. And, and, and that's why Paul in verse 19, to lighten up a little bit, he says, beloved. Yeah. Beloved. And I, I know what I'm saying to you is it, coming pretty. But, but, but beloved, never avenge yourself. Never take the circumstances of your life into your own hands. But leave it to the wrath of God. Well, why am I going to do that, Paul? Because uh, the Lord has said, uh, there it is again, for it is written. Notice, quit trying to interpret life through your eyes and through how you feel. Whenever you interpret life through what you see and what you feel, you're going to come up with a wrong interpretation. Life is to be interpreted by what God said. So when you find yourself in a difficult place, in a difficult spot, you got to find out what has God said about this. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And the reason the Lord said I will repay because, see, if you try to repay, you might overpay him. But then there's the possibility that you could underpay them. But when God pays, they're going to get their just due. But to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what should we do? Feed him. If he's thirsty, what should we do? Give him something to drink. Because when you do this, you're actually... Uh, dropping, heaping, burning coals on his head. Now, your aim in doing what the word of God tells you to do is not in order to see hot coals on his head. You're doing it in obedience to God. And God is causing the coals to burn on his head. Well, I'm through now. Then he said, but, and, and do not overcome Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These responses are only made possible, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. And they are extended to us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Mercies should teach us how to respond to God in submission, Mercy should teach us how to respond to our 
fellow brother and sister, and mercy should teach us how to respond to the enemy. Now, I got to close this, but I, I got I to gotta help you to see Christ. I got to help you to see his unique greatness. Well, where do we most clearly in this passage see his unique greatness? It's actually in this section of verses 21, I mean, uh, verses 17 through 21. Get this, get this. The very thing he tells us to do in relationship to our enemy is what he did in relationship to us when we were his enemy. And that's why it required the mercies of chapter 1 through 11. What do you mean? Was because he didn't repay your evil for evil. But he looked to do what was honorable in the sight of all, especially in the sight of his father. Every opportunity that he had in relationship with you, his enemy, he kept trying to make peace with you. When you still and continue to want to have a war. He very well could have avenged himself. But rather than avenging himself against you, watch this, he left it to the wrath of God. What do you mean he left it to the wrath of God? The wrath of God that you deserved as his enemy is the wrath of God that he absorbed for his enemy. The very one that's fighting against him. He said, God, what they deserve, uh, put it on me. When you were hungry, he fed you. When you were thirsty, he gave you something to drink. What was he doing? He was overcoming evil with good. Saints, get this. The work, the worst thing on earth that has ever happened to you. Please get this. The worst thing on earth that has ever happened to you is an extension of the mercies of God. Let me say that again. The worst thing that has ever happened to you, Keelan Atkinson, was soaked and saturated in the mercies of God. Because if it was not, you'd be in hell. So how do we, what, what's, the, what's the application? Take your eyes off of your miseries and learn to reflect on God's mercies. When you become consumed in mind and heart and spirit with the extended redemptive mercies that God has shown you, uh, the miseries don't look that bad. Hmm. When you focus on his mercies, guess what you'll end up concluding? you'll end up finding yourself singing, saying, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And everything I've ever needed, all your hand has provided. Great is the faithfulness of God. Oh, saints, may we trust him. May we love him. May we reflect on his mercies and take our eyes off of uh, the miseries that we can be committed 
to do ministry. God, our Father, we thank you today. Thank you for life, for health, and strength. Thank you for redemptive mercy. Lord, we were, we were lost. We were on our way to a place that was never even prepared for us. For you said that hell was prepared for the devil, not us. But by your loving kindness, tender mercy, and sovereign grace, you have transformed us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son. Oh God, help us now by the power of your Holy Spirit to respond in ways that show that we have relationship with you and that we have relationship with our brothers and sisters and we even know how to deal with the relationship of our enemies. Hide this word in our heart that we may not sin against you. God, I love you, I thank you, and I praise you. For it is in Jesus' name. It's in Jesus' name. We pray and ask. Amen. Let the church say amen. God bless you. I pray that your Sunday was sent to you in your walk and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there might be someone who has uh, heard the Word of God preach and you're not clear on how it is that you can have personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear. If you will repent of your sin, that is, acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you have sinned, and you fall short of the glory of God. So you repent of your sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he died, that he was buried, and that on the third day that he rose, and that he one day will soon be coming back uh, for you. Now, if you would like to have a personal one-on-one -on -one to talk with us, to uh, get to know the way of faith, uh, on our Facebook page there are connection cards, and all you have to do is simply fill out that information we will reach out and contact you. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. Now it's time for our benediction. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, his forth and forever. God's people all say, Amen. Turn to your screen for tithing and giving options. And thank you for your stewardship and support for Word Fellowship Reform Baptist Church. It's tithing and giving time. Praise the Lord. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency and all things may have an abundance for every good work. Three ways to give your tithes and offering are by mail, online, or in person. If you choose to give your tithes and offering by mail, please do not send cash. Access online giving at www.givelify.com or use the Givelify app. If you choose to give your tithes and offering in person, please schedule your pickup day and time with a designated deacon. Join us every Sunday for our online Sunday service right here on Facebook starting at 1045 a.m. Join us every Thursday starting at 730 p.m. for our online Bible study. Our current study topic is the priority of prayer in ministry in crisis times. Well, this concludes this week's announcements. We are keeping you all in our prayers. We love you all and may God bless you richly.